It has never been harder to win from the jungle than right now. Why? Because every single day you are frying your brain listening to the wrong people. You are killing your pathing and you are killing your chance to jungle diff. And because of all of that, you are killing your ability to climb. The average jungler has worse attention span than a fruit fly and that's who you're competing against. So the good news means that with just the tiniest bit of discipline and bad habit breaking behavior, you will already be ahead of 90% of junglers. And all of that starts with ostrich level jungling, a term I've used before, but in this case, I'm meaning it a little bit differently. When you're extremely focused on the camps that you're farming and not checking what laners are doing, but not only that, everything in between. Now it might seem simple, but it's something you all fail at from iron all the way up to low master. And what happens is when you fix this, it allows you all of a sudden to notice how much you're missing. Think of it as most of you junglers have visible light, regular eyes like the rest of us, but that's only 1.5% of all that can be seen. Open your eyes even wider, activate the full electromagnetic spectrum, and you're gonna notice all of the things that allow you to be the better jungler. Clip one is a straightforward one. We have two POVs, a Nyla, or however you say it, Nila Nyla, who killed the ADC is casually CSing, while Shivana is just beelining towards the Krugs when Nyla is pushing. Why is she doing this? Go and do something, go and clean it up. Obviously take the 99% play, yes? And you might think, well, yeah, in the end she goes for the kill and she's actually able to get it, but the problem is she wasted so much tempo and the kill actually gets taken by somebody else. You want to 1v9 as a jungler? Stop keeping your head in the sand, go and kill the person who's over pushing and over splitting, then fall back to your crubs, raptors, and whatever play might be next. When you handle the business that can be handled in the moment, you get the most out of a situation. And for that, you absolutely must head over to vukai.gg. I have a free jungle improvement resource as well as a dedicated program where we have jungle video courses, jungle coaching, coaching VOD libraries, weekly free video content see nowhere else, as well as Q&As and patch note rundowns, as well as a private jungle discord. And if there's one thing I'm good at, it's making junglers reach their goals as we saw with the record number of people hitting them at the end of season 13. If you want to climb faster than anyone you know, jungle diff every game you play, click the link below or head to vakayu.gg. What about this one? We have a Diana who does a quadrant clear and recalls, right? But Scuttle is spawning on the bottom side and likely the enemy jungler the least Sin is already there to clear it since she is too far behind in terms of tempo to actually take it. So instead of thinking of going back to the other side and recall, shadow the mid lane. Understand that Lee Sin's gonna take this Scuttle crab and actually go for this gank. Don't go back to base when you don't need to. Not only is shadowing the mid lane good here because the Orianna has good setup with Elise Sin and is always a threat for a Cho'Gath to die, but the Cho'Gath was also one level above the Diana. This means that in terms of a 2v2, you can assess, okay, wait, we can actually go ahead and do something great here. If obviously you cannot do anything great and your mid laner just needs to protect themselves, use your vision to ping and say, listen, Cho'Gath, back up. You don't, wait a second, the Cho'Gath killed the Orianna. Yeah, imagine if you were just there because you could extrapolate where Elise Sin is. Not paying attention to the lanes is one thing. Not rotating to pick up kills is another, but not tracking the enemy jungler and cutting him off from doing things, that's a failure of jungle denial, and that will keep you low elo. And finally, the third clip here talking about bad habits, we have the same Diana doing blue into grubs in a different game. No prio while there's a fight going on in the mid lane. Instead of going to grubs, why can't we join the fight? Why are we doing grubs while watching this fight? Go ahead and get that kill, get the prio, and then do the grubs. Now instead we can test the grubs, we flash away from the Darius when we could have used the flash for later to get a kill or something. We see the Rumble is also doing the same mistake by engaging with a numbers disadvantage, but it doesn't excuse the Diana not going to the fight as well. And that's the thing, sometimes you have to kill and then objective, and sometimes you can objective and ignore the fight because you're never going to be able to do anything. But you don't know that unless you open your eyes and actually see everything that there is to see. The second point here is pretty damn important, and it's if you don't have prior for an objective or anything, then look for something else and do not overforce, or else you're going to flip the game and lose. End of story, it's that simple. If you see them start up a dragon because someone in your team died, don't even waste a microsecond. Literally, this example here, we see this cane waffle a little bit about, you know, maybe doing the dragon, stealing it, then eventually decides not to and sequences up. The enemy Viego does some psychopathic jungling to loop all the way around and invade his blue. Why? Couldn't tell you, he just felt he was confident. Because of this, the enemy Viego gets into the brush before the cane arrives and is able to face check him and kill him. If the cane had simply not waffled it with indecision and just fully committed to sequencing up and giving up the dragon, he would have been in the brush, seen the Viego, and had the upper hand himself. And this is a very good example of where these niche timings can have strong impact. That was a diamond level example. And all of this video is about everyone beneath Master Tier, specifically Low Elo, Mid MMR, to get you to Master Tier. Now, we take the reference from the last clip in terms of prior. Since this Jax had no prior for both mid and bot lane, it's fine to give her the dragon. But instead, we give a kill to the enemy Twisted Fade, we make Jin move to an uncomfortable position, and we achieve nothing but pain and despair. 
So you can see not only can it have an extrapolation issue with the Cana Viego, it can simply cause pain for everybody involved and you don't even get the dragon instead of maybe getting dives and camps on the other side. If you fully commit immediately to knowing you can't contest, you will win out. Same player, same thing, no prio, mid and bot lane. What's worse in this clip is that the bottom lane comes, loses Sums and Drake in the process. So what was the point of contesting Drake if Yone was not mid either and bot lane had to awkwardly rotate? As junglers, you've just got to open your eyes. Clip number three, the enemy bot lane is already a Drake whilst yours isn't. Your mid can't help you at all. So why contest? We die here for what? To get the Lilia to scale harder? To think we could maybe magically steal it and it's good for us if we die? The best thing you can do if you're diamond and below is when you can immediately recognize whether you can or cannot do an objective through numbers advantage, through back timings, through regular item resets. And as soon as you open your eyes to this, trust me, you're going to get a lot more econ. The third biggest problem and bad habit amongst all junglers is the inability to adapt your pathing to reality. It's all very well adhering to a game plan, but if the game plan doesn't allow you to actually adjust to what's really happening in the game, you're going to end up with a theoretical basis of Kindra being a Z-tier mid laner. And we all know that that just isn't true. Or number three, we want to talk about when you don't have strict pathing and you don't adapt to situations in the right way. What that also means is will you take advantage of situations that are given to you by the enemy jungler? And basically, most of you watching this video, the enemy jungler will make mistakes. We look at this cane, he starts bottom side, the vice starts top side. The Vi passes all the way down, that's great, good for her level 4, right? The cane decides not to finish his full clear and go deep ward into the right side jungle for literally zero reason. Why would you do this? Just finish your grump get level 4. He decides to go for the mid lane gang, where Vi is present as well. Because he invested time in warding something that did not need to be warded, Vi will immediately go, aha uh ha, -huh, you're level 3 with 24 CS. That means you did a full clear without doing an edge camp and you took the Scuttle Crab. Because if you did a full clear without doing the Scuttle Crab, you'd be level 4. Immediately you have to recognize that advantage. What this means is you have to adapt your party immediately. If you didn't plan on contesting and doing grubs, now you can because you know the Kane's gonna have his respawn Krugs and Raptors on the bottom side. You know you've itemization advantage. You can easily do Krugs, Raptors into the grubs. Cool, easy, smurfing it. Now the Kane can decide to sequence it up and control his camps from you, but if he decides to loop back to the bottom lane, take a ward out, good for him, I hope he's happy with that. Immediately you know because you understand the camps are respawning that his top side camps are available. You go ahead and snack those. The problem with the cane here is he cannot adapt anymore. He has nothing else to do. You could have easily reset from the grubs and come to the bottom side. You could have just simply finished the grubs and sequenced all the way to the bottom side and he can't contest you. He's lost all of his options and so he goes mid lane and doesn't think about the one that Vi actually did because he doesn't adapt, he sticks to one pathing and guess what? Vi kills him and he dies again. Now he respawns and we don't quite know where the cane's going to go from the perspective of Vi, but we do know we have all our top side camps available and we want the dragon. We also know that the cane is not going to be able to really do much about this game, so we decide to go ahead and do our top side camps and sequence down. If the cane shows himself in the bad position, we can rotate and kill him. Guess what? He did exactly that. Why? Because that's what he does. He five camps and wards deep, goes for under leveled fights, and then does bottom lane and loops back and ganks bottom lane. He just keeps doing it over and over and over again, and enemy junglers recognize what they're doing, adapt their pathing accordingly, punish him, and smurfingly win the early game. The whole thing is logical. I don't know where he learned this, what coach told him this. Just finish your full clear. You have more than enough time with the Vice at a top lane to go war deep in a jungle afterwards, and you can be level four for the good fights you want to fight. Not random fights, down a level and down gold for no reason. That was not a challenger example. That was a mid MMR diamond example, representative of low elo pathing. Let's jump into a challenger example to show you what we mean. And immediately from the get-go, this is not a regular clear. You get a leash on the red, you start raptors. This cane knows he's against the graves and red side junglers who might psychopathically on graves and of course canes and belvets, maybe even go raptors into the blue grump. So he starts on his walls with the intent of clearing his blue side quadrant and then sequencing down. This means that if there is a weird invade, a late invade, he will be ready and right there to deal with it. He doesn't have to deal with it because graves decides to be a human being both sequence down. Immediately, Kane sees the Graves going for the gank at the bottom side, showing himself, and instead of contesting something you can't contest, he's happy to lane gratification for the top scuttle. Goes and tries to gank mid lane to create prior for himself, and takes a scuttle crab on the top side. The importance for this is that the Graves now cannot double scuttle, he sees the Kane do this, and has to recall. The Kane also knows that by doing this, making this decision immediately, adapting immediately to what's going on, to seeing everything with full vision, that he cannot contest a crab and creating a 10 to 15 second advantage over the graves by doing this allows him to control his own tempo. It also means that the graves will reset first and have itemization first and be on the grubs first. 
So the cane decides, look, I'm not going to be able to do these right now. I'm going to do the respawn of my blue side quadrant, the wolves and the grub. Graves can go ahead and do his top side quadrant, gank top lane, take the grubs. I know he's going to do these things. But because I gave these up as well, I give up the bottom scuttle, I give up the top side, it means my bottom side camps are going to be available, but so are his bottom side camps going to be available because we started on the top side and sequence down together. But if I see a play I can make, a dive, a gank, instead of taking camps blindly, I'm going to rotate to it. It just showcases how immediately you can sense a challenger jungler understands flexibility and adaptation based upon everything we've talked about in this video so far, and when you fix these habits, yeah, you don't get as many kills, but your resources are juiced. Now, you would have seen the fact that the Graves got pushed off with the Grubs. That might not happen in your games, but if it does, you just keep rotating. The Kane understands this, notices this while he was doing his own business. So just falls back again to his bottom side camp, secures them, cleans up the final Grub, controls his top side camps. And if you have ganks that show up a little bit more frequently, if you have opportunities to rotate to scenarios and obviously get your kills, do it. But this was just a raw example of pathing and understanding the fundamentals and from this, all goodness will occur. The fourth thing is something that we've kind of mentioned a few times in this video already, the disregard of prior. But do you also pay attention to recall timers and understanding how that mashes with your tempo? Short clip here, but skirmishing in the river with no prior, nobody around into the nidley, you die for no reason. If you're gonna skirmish and not understand where your lanes are in terms of the reset, you're gonna take fights that are bad. Part of taking good fights is looking immediately at the map and saying, look, I wanna go fight. What is going on with my laners or their laners? What if you're someone who's maybe named Bert and you're deciding to play Zack and you're thinking, let's go jungling? Well, bottom line wants to take plates and recall because good things have happened and they want to get their gold, spend their gold, and then, you know, use their advantage in the next phase of the game. The problem as a jungler is when you go in a straight line through several bushes and you never think, oh, maybe I should scan for wards, maybe I shouldn't invade, maybe I should recognize my bottom lane wants to reset, well, then you're kind of signing your death warrant, aren't you? You're invading with no lens to check if the previous little process checked out in terms of is it warded, you're not paying attention to what your bottom lane wants to actually accomplish, which is go back to base. So if you end up in a situation where you want to do this invade, but your bottom lane and your laners don't want to do an invade, and you're noticing that you have nothing else to do in this particular moment, your pathing beforehand was catastrophic. The third example here is maybe you want to contest grubs, yet you want to try and grab the first one away just to get that experience spike and then bounce. You know you can't have a long fight. But then when you try and kill the enemy Remus and you have no prior in both mid and top, why are we doing this? Why do we go in and die for something that we don't need to take? And that bounces off of the previous thing. When you understand prior, when you understand when to give things up and you recognize that if they're going to spend their time doing this, what can I take from them? What can I get ahead of them? It's all about tempo. If you can let them invest time into the grubs and get tempo dead, where you have a big time advantage over them now, yes, they get something handful, something real, golden experience, and you get nothing. But if you're sequencing all the way down, maybe ganking the bottom lane, maybe then invading their red side, falling back to a dragon, all because they chose to, you know, do the grubs, and you created a full sequence, plus prior for yourself, plus took an objective that wasn't contested, plus counter jungled them and pushed them out of their jungle, all of that is worth giving up the grubs. And that's the idea of if someone invests time badly, poorly, or in an ill-advised manner, you have now free time advantage over them. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, it doesn't matter. When you do that, how you use that time will determine how big your jungle difference is. And if you waste it trying to, you know, do the same thing as them, you normalize it. What does that mean? you get hard stuck. Break this habit. Finally, it's a very important thing. We take all of this stuff out and now everyone's going to think it's a bit of a doctrine. I need to always do this. I need to always do that. Sometimes it's okay to actually contest and fight things without prior. Why? Because you just might be damn fed. You might be strong enough to push them off of it and actually go and kill them. You might be the least in who can leave the base, go ahead, contest a Viego, kill him and take the two grubs that he was doing because you know you can. That's another example of being flexible of understanding adaptation and being aware of who you are and who they are. Everyone always thinks of one game plan, one cheese strategy, and they think that's the only thing they have to do. They don't adapt if the game plan changes or not. And yes, this is a bit of a general point, but I think it's very, very important to understand that if people go for these cheese invades and you have to set up vertical, how you respond to that is your adaptability, it's your flexibility. You now know that they're stuck in this method of cheesing. If you're smart enough, you can adapt to counter them, and while they might have a small advantage now, they won't in the future. Wing count assessment, therefore, is really poor for most junglers. If you think your wing count is indeed bottom lane, but your bottom lane dies twice before you can do anything, you should probably change the plan and play around someone who is winning. Learn to 2v8 with the people who are actually capable of 2v8ing. And when you think about win condition and game plans in such a rigid way, it gives you a huge bias over certain champions. Even to the champions that are playing too, but you think too much about what a champion might do, when the reality can be something else. It's as I've said for seven damn years. Play what is, 
not what should be. Maybe my idea was to snowball a Draven, get all the grubs and shove it down their throat, but my Draven somehow lost the lane to a Zyra ADC and a support Kai'Sa. Yeah, I don't know how he did it, but he did it. This is actually a little hypothetical because it didn't happen, but I needed a ridiculous example because when that does happen and you notice that you have someone winning top lane that shouldn't be, hey, maybe I should just snowball around that. And finally, to encapsulate this video in one simple point, say you have a lane that has negative prior, like a Sona support against a hooking champion. Could be the Thresh, the Pikes, the Blitzcranks, the Nautiluses, who cares? Wait, that's all the hooking champions, right? Well, I guess there's a joke in there about that, but we'll just carry on. It doesn't mean that you can never do something with that lane. Sona isn't so useless that you have to wait for her to be level 16. At level 11, she's already come online. And imagine if she's level 11 and everyone else is level 8, especially in the bottom lane. So what it means is that the lane is more volatile and you have to play around it a bit more than you should. Not every lane is going to be good early or have good ganking setup. So knowing how to play with such disadvantages in terms of look, I'm actually going to focus on sequencing and counter juggling and I'm going to have specific ganks later on. This will help you think properly about evolving the win cons as you go. Not to mention the fact that people in solo queue are not all faker in disguise. So they won't play 100% perfectly every game. The environment of solo queue is a chaotic one in and of itself. You might think your lane might win or lose. You might think the enemy jungler should not have gotten fed. You might think that you should have gotten fed, but all of those things can't happen. When you're flexible, you're able to understand how to adapt to these things and actually just open your eyes to the possibilities. That's when you start to climb faster and easier. And now in this video, you've gotten a few tips about how to open your eyes, but you're saying you're still speaking generally. What do you mean? Well, click in this video to find out.